<laughs> Multiple offer situations. I don't really like this. Properly navigating a potential minefield. It's it's not if you prepare and if you set the expectations correctly from the beginning and you have a system for dealing with multiple offers. Mm -hmm. So it's only a potential minefield if you're not prepared. So right now, seller's market, you should always be prepared for a uh, potential of many offers coming in. So we're going to identify multiple offer situation and what the risks are to the seller. Review the seller's options in multiple offers. Review and discuss various multiple offer scenarios and look at the buyer agent responsibilities to your clients in those situations. So multiple offers arise when a listing agent, you have knowledge of another bona fide written offer. So what's a bona fide written offer? When the agent calls you to register their offer? No, that, that would be um, letting you know that an offer's on its way. So having it in hand? Having it in hand, yeah. And that's, and, and it's really important because Aaron, a lot of realtors who've been in the business for a long time think it's what you said first. And it's not. And you're going to have agents, you're gonna have buyer's agents who call you as a listing agent who think they've sent you an offer because they told you they were sending you an offer. When I have it in writing with everyone's signatures and everything filled out, that's when I have an offer and not a second before. And you are gonna have people lose their minds over um, your response to that. And the biggest struggle with multiple offers is everyone's clear understanding of how they work. So that's why we review it. If you are in a multiple offer situation, who should be involved with you? Your manager. Thank you very much. <laughs> Not a hard question. Um, this is always our answer. Um, and it's not because we're abdicating responsibility. This is who you are responsible for and to. And this is the person who is responsible for um, your performance on these deals as when you're new. They need to be involved because it, gets, it can get sticky and they're going to help you navigate. And it's, they're the captain. Right now, you're a sailor in training for captainhood. Uh, you're just not there yet. So let them, let them captain you. It's fine. It's a good thing. It really is such a good thing. If, and the more, the better your relationship with your manager, the better your career seems to go. It just does. So if you, if you have somebody you like, you trust, you work with, and, you, and they like and trust you, it, guess what? It works out beautifully. So build those relationships with your managers um, from early days before you start having offers. Um, and if you've already got them, good on you. Um, an early offer is scheduled or presented or has been presented and is not yet accepted or the seller has verbally countered or has verbally accepted with no written acceptance. The only thing that matters is written. I was just going to, I was just going to say, is a verbal offer a thing? Not in New York state. It's not. No. It's got to be in writing. It can be in writing on a cocktail napkin, but it needs to be in writing. It doesn't even matter if it's a handshake. You'll hear people, oh, we shook hands on it. Did you write on your hand? And was it something I could take with me? <laughs> if I can't take your yeah, hand with me, then it's not a written offer. It's got to be written down and you have to have possession of that writing. And, the, and you will have agents call you to say, well, you know, my, my people are thinking of putting an offer in. And, you know, what'll, what will your people take? And it's like, don't you don't engage in that. It's like, put something in writing and let's have a dialogue because if somebody's not willing to take the time to sit down with their agent and write up a purchase offer, they're never gonna. So, uh, you know, don't don't even engage in that conversation. Put it in writing and we'll chat. 
In all multiple offer situations, remember all steps taken must be for the ultimate benefit of the client, not you, not the licensee. So fiduciary duty means what, literally? What does it mean? If we were in a classroom, I would have you all stand up and take a giant step forward and say, fiduciary duty means putting my client step forward ahead of my own. Yes, putting my client's interest ahead of my own. Everybody say it with me. What's your fiduciary duty? Putting my client's, my client's interest, interest ahead, ahead of, of my, my own. own. Say it again. Putting my Period. client's interest, interest ahead, of, ahead my of my own. own. So with that, do not get married to the paycheck. When you've closed, yes. you can marry yourself to the paycheck. Before yeah, my mother. Closing, don't. <laughs> Go ahead, Jen. My mother was a real estate agent for years prior to me getting my license. And when I got my license, she said, my only piece of advice to you is don't spend the commission until you have it in your hand. <laughs> Even mentally. Um, it interferes with your performance of your duties. When your commission is top of mind, you, it interferes with your performance of your duties. Just do your job to the best of your ability to its completion. And if you get a paycheck at the end of it, that's a beautiful thing. Is that what you're striving for? Of course. But when you put your paycheck on the top of your mind, it interferes and, it, it, and it's, it'll reduce your opportunity to, to get income. Just keep working every deal. Keep working, don't work on only one. You gotta be working, you have multiple things going on at once. You gotta be prospecting every day. You have to be writing deals. You need to be closing so that you have a constant flow of income. And if you're doing that, and if you've got something that's a problem, get your manager involved, step away, let your attorneys and your manager and everybody else handle it. And you do the communication that you're supposed to do and then keep working your job. Keep working your job so you're gonna get paid. Clients interest of putting or fiduciary duty, putting your clients interest ahead of your own. Um, the listing agent upon gaining knowledge of another written offer on the home must immediately advise the seller of his or her options, even though the seller is in negotiation with another buyer. So when you get a purchase offer, what are you obligated to do? Present it. Notify present right all offers. You must present. It's not an option. If they've already accepted, you still have to present the offer. But now you have to educate the seller. You've accepted an offer. I just want you to know this other offers come in and it could be for a lot more money. It depends on where you are in the process. Do you have an attorney approval period? Are you in it? Or have you passed it? Do you have the earnest deposit? Do you, are you past mortgage commitment? They can come in at any time. Do, are, have all the contingencies been met? And um, they may have options, they may not have options. It depends on where they are, but you still have to present it. That's your obligation is to present. They may not be able to act on it, but you have to present, depending on where you are. You gotta measure your risk. Buyers don't always want uh, to compete to buy a property. Right now, buyers don't really have that option. If they wanna buy a house, they're going to compete almost always. Very seldom will they not be competing. Uh, buyers may decide to withdraw their offers while this can happen, um, experience indicates that the risk of buyers withdrawing is not substantial. We must inform the seller of the potential risk. So again, if you are a buyer's agent and you have your people putting more of a deposit, there is a little bit more on the table for them to risk. So this is why a bigger earnest deposit can help you win an offer. So if, I have a, if I'm an agent and I'm putting in a really great offer, 10,000 over, but I'm putting in a $500 deposit, but I've got the same offer and I'm putting in a $10,000 or $5,000 deposit is this, this selling agent, which one am I taking? I'm taking that bigger offer with a bigger earnest deposit. 
because I don't want them to walk away because $500 wasn't enough to keep them in the game. They're going to go make an offer on another house. And with right now, they may be looking at way more houses because they, they're trying to make sure that they're going to get the one they want. And they may be willing to risk $500 to just get their foot in the door and then be willing to walk away from it to get that other offer. It's not a good game and you shouldn't be playing it as a buyer's agent. Uh, but you aren't responsible for how other agents work. You're only responsible for yourself. So make sure your seller knows what the obligation, what the risks are. Um, most sellers want to encourage multiple offers. Why? Drive the price. And uh, the price will go up most likely. Yeah. So you, who's going to get more money? The seller. Thank you. It's hard not to say me, right? Um, you will also, it can't be top of mind. It can't be your motivation. It has to be that you're putting your sellers in the best opportunity to get the most bang for their buck. However, it, you also wanna make sure it's appraising. I've seen a few that went nuts. Um, and then we have had in our area, we've had some that uh, fell very short of where the offers went in an appraisal um, and deals had to be renegotiated and um, some deals fell apart. There's a pretty good stream of back on the market um, because it fell apart and it's often because of a price or because of the other one, which is home inspection. They didn't have one and then something was discovered uh, along the way and it fell apart. Um, so that, you know, it's, it's really good to just to do, as we said a little bit ago, start out with your best habits. Now, put the best deals together using the best of what we know to get buyers a sound home in good condition for the right amount of money. Um, are they going to spend a little bit more? Yeah, they are. Fortunately for them, the lending costs are offsetting some of those prices because they're, they're paying lower amounts on the, on more mortgage. Maggie? Yeah. Um, the deposit, um, we as a seller um, agent, we set the, the, the price of the um, deposit, how much they have to deposit. Who's doing it? The buyer's agent. So they put in like, they can put in like hundred bucks or 500 bucks, whatever they want to put in. Yep. And so they, they have that conversation with their buyers and they find out what they have in, in hand. Um, and you tell them that the uh, best way for them to win the offer is, is to have more skin in the game, to prove that they're not going to walk away, that they're committed to this house. This is, mm -hmm. this is the house that they want. And that we want to make a strong statement to our seller that we want this home and we're willing to put more money on the line for it. And they get it back if something falls apart, like the home inspection is legally. Bad and... Yes, legal. If they if if through legal, if they change their mind, no, they're risking it. But if through an inspection or something like that, it fell apart, yes, they would get it back. If they do not get it back on day one, it takes about two weeks. And it's held in a non-interest bearing account, which you should make clear from the moment they write the check. This is going to go into a non-interest bearing account. Which is an escrow account. So the whoever's holding it can't use it for other things. <laughs> you have to put it in in a few days, right? Like what, three or five days? You have two. Two days. 48 hours, calendar days. Doesn't matter what day of the week it is. And the, so the money, because some people are like, well, why can't I just get my check back? The proper way of how it is supposed to go is that the listing broker must deposit it. It has to clear, and then they write a check back out. So that's why there can be, it can take up to two weeks to wow. have all that process happen. But and it has to flow through an accounting department. It has a you know, put it on the sheet in the, in the plus column and then in the debit column. And then they, you know, it's a, it's a process. So it, and so you need to tell them if we were returned, it would take 10 to 10 days to two weeks to, uh, for that to be processed. Once the, once the request is made, 
Mm-hmm. <laughs> so you have to request that back too, and you have to cancel the contract. So it really, it's a little bit cumbersome. So what happened if this, uh, I get a check on a Friday evening, banks are closed, and then Monday is a holiday, bank holiday, what do you do? You still have to get it to your listing office. So to, to the office, but it's not deposit in the bank, it's just at the office. But yeah. they are, they're depositing as soon as they're able. Okay, okay. Got it. Hey, Maggie. Yep. Yes. Something I found too, um, from my personal experience of buying and selling is <clears throat> the larger the earnest money deposit that a buyer puts to a contract, it does, it does in, in our world consider it as a stronger offer. But I think in the mind of the seller, the perception is that the buyer is in a stronger financial position to be able to support the contract. So yeah. just putting it in from a, you know, from a, a you know, a, a perceptional based thinking of, of the customer, of the seller, you know, that's the way they would view that stronger earnest money deposit. Absolutely. Not, not just of interest in the property, but in the financial capability of executing the contract. Absolutely. You're totally correct. Yep. Um, So remind them that they can't guarantee the buyers will agree to participate in a multiple offer. So the problem with a multiple offer is um, some buyers will say, I don't want to be in a, that's their right. They don't have to. Uh, but we can't make anybody write a purchase offer. In this market, if a buyer's agent isn't in uh, helping, setting the expectation for the buyers that that's a likelihood right now, they're not doing them a service. So the service they do is to set the expectation. We're going to put in an offer. It's likely going to be many offers. So we want to put in our highest and best, strongest offer with a good deposit from the get-go. So what things are most important to us on this particular property? And write the offer based on that. All begins with that initial conversation. Should start before you've ever gone to look at the first house. Ready to get that? Any questions about that? Okay. Measure your risk. When presented with multiple offers, sellers have three basic objections. Jen, you want to take it? Options. Options. Objections, options. Oh, yeah, whatever. (laughs) So the the three basic options are the seller may accept one of the offers. The seller may reject all offers and ask that each buyer formulate a new offer for a multiple offer presentation. That's when when you go back and ask for highest and best. Or the seller may counter offer one of the offers and reject the other offers or attempt to keep the other offer open for a time. That gets a little dicey. Um, But, you know, just be aware that a seller doesn't even have to accept a full price offer. That the, it's the seller's prerogative to reject everything. Um, you know, why, why are they going through the pain and agony of selling their house? Hopefully to sell their house, but you just never know. They don't have to have a reason, you, you know, even if it's a full price offer, it could be rejected for whatever reason. It could be a time frame issue or, you know, whatever. So Maggie, I was just going to say that I, I have a, I had a house, a farm on 90 acres of land that we listed at 265. Uh, we had 11 groups through the open house. We received nine offers. One of those offers was $295,000 uh, conventional with a $10,000 deposit. They wanted a well and a septic inspection. They wanted a home inspection. They wanted a pest inspection. They wanted radon inspection and they wanted um, mold and chimney inspections. They received three offers for 275, which also had a number of um, contingencies. They received a cash offer for 225 no inspections. Which offer do you think they took? Cash offer. No inspection. They did because they didn't want to deal with it. Even though I told them, if you take the 285, the 295, 
even if we have to fix the septic system, I still think you'll be up $20,000. They said, we don't want to do it. And we don't mortgage. want it. Mm -hmm. We just want to sell the property, which had been in the family since 1964, I think. Um, and it, it, they didn't want to deal with it. So they took the 225 cash. The price is not always the driver of these deals. Um, you know, and everybody's situation is different. And if you're the buyer's agent, it's good to have that conversation with the listing agent to say, you know, what's their biggest motivation? It's usually going to be money, but not always. So it's okay to have that conversation with the listing agent to find out because you'll be surprised a lot of buyer's agents will not pick up the phone and ask. And it could be to your benefit that it may be a time frame issue, not necessarily a money issue. Yeah, and so, my cash offer could close in 30 days and they could be done with it. And they were also willing to wait 60 days if they needed time to clear out because they'd been there for so long. So they were flexible on closing. So they were like, we want the 225 or we want to be done. So they took that. And as um, I think, Jens, you started to ask if it was an appraisal issue, wasn't the 90 acres were worth 265. Um, the house was worth like nothing. <laughs> it was a wreck. It's an 1890 farmhouse that had been lived in hard um, generationally. And it, it, you walked in and the cat whiz smell just about knocked you down. Uh, it was a cold, very cold April rainy day. I had every freaking window in the house open. Usually I want a home warm and comfortable. What I wanted was to try to get rid of as much cat smell as I could. And um, people still walked in and went, whoa. <laughs> And I'm not kidding, literally. Yeah, Shauna. Um, so on your point of it being the, you know, 90 acres um, or whatnot, I thought the appraisals were really just based on the house and five acres. It usually is, but the house, where this house was, that property, um, that they could have knocked that house down um, and rebuild on that property and not and still been okay. Um, I was better off with the cash offer, to your point, but there was a standing house that had been lived in. It was livable, but it needed a rehab loan um, or somebody with deep pockets, which, so when I listed it, I said, it's not FHA, VA eligible. I said, it's conventional cash or conventional or rehab loan. By the way, when you're checking the cash, cash only means only cash. There's cash and there's cash only. Cash only means you're only accepting cash. So you should not see, and you will see, cash only and conventional and FHA and VA all checked. That's not correct. Cash, <laughs> cash only means that's it. And it's, that's for a property that has to be sold as is and that you can't get a mortgage for it. Yeah, and for the properties that you can get a mortgage for, but you accepted a cash offer, a lot of times people then turn around and get a mortgage, which, you know, I think that's sort of not cool, uh, but it happens often. So just, you know, be aware. Um, but yeah, to go back to this, uh, talk to your manager about what the local practice is. Um, it, you know, better part of Valor don't, uh, I've, I've seen it happen twice in my 20 years where a house is sold on paper twice. Eek, it's a, it's a lawsuit waiting to happen. It's just not a good position. Don't think you're, you're the best negotiator in the world for your sellers because you're trying to negotiate more than one deal at a time. It's, it's not a good practice. I know it's done. Uh, I, I recommend to everyone to not do it uh, just because of that reason. It's, yep. it's a super slippery slope that can get out of hand real, real quick. So um, you don't want to sell the same house at the same time twice. Yep. So work one deal at a time until you can't work it anymore. Put people in a backup position if you can, and and uh, but work one deal at a time. Usually, your first offer is your best offer, 
was what they say. So try to work with your first buyer. I try to get them to buy the house because every day the house is on the market, the price slips. Um, on the accept, reject, and counter, I've told you this, I'll say it again. I tell my sellers, I tell my buyers, deal's not going to die in our lap. We're going to counter until somebody says yes or no. I'll, I'll just keep coming back. I don't care if you come at me with a ch uh, chicken and a goat. Yep, we accept. Accept the price to be $300,000. Yep, just be be aware that if an offer, if you counter, that last offer disappears. Um, just and and that's a an, an a distinction that you need to make sure that everybody is aware of, uh, because some people are like, oh no, okay, let's go back, and and the other party can say, mm, sorry, once you countered, that goes away. Um, so. Just something to think about. And when you're writing your purchase offers, new agents, one of the things that confuses people is when you get a counter offer and it says, like it might say $200,000 is the price that was offered on the purchase offer. Then you've got a counter. It says, um, accept price to be 220,000. You don't have to redo the whole purchase contract. That page substitutes that price. But who's gonna be involved in your purchase offer? I was going to say, check with your manager because local practices are going to be different. <laughs> so check with your manager so that you're doing it correctly. Um, and it says right here what Jen just said, different offers handle multiple offers differently. Check with your manager for local practices. That's true on everything. Check with your manager on local practices. A seller has many options in a multiple offer situation. First, the listing agent needs to communicate all offers with the seller. I use an Excel document. I have all the, I have uh, list price, offer price, earnest deposit, um, mortgage commitment dates, or uh, I have mortgage or cash or which, what type of mortgage it is, FHA, VA, uh, conventional, whatever it is, amount down, the earnest deposit, mortgage commitment date, uh, closing date, uh, any mm -hmm. contingencies all written down. I number my offers when they come in. Number First one that comes in is number one. Second one comes in is number two. Um, I put them all together, one, two, three, four, whatever. I put them on my Excel document, or I sometimes have had three and four pages um, so that I can get them all in. And I, I don't present them by terms. I present them by the way they came in because I try to keep it as neutral as possible. And I present my, I bring all the contracts with me, but I show them the Excel document to my sellers. And then we go over the terms and we talk about why one thing might be better than the other for them, not for me. I put down the agent's name. I put down the company name that they represented. Um, even at all the information that I have, I put it on an Excel document. Makes it very clean and easy for them to look at. I tell them, take a highlighter and tell me which things appeal to them. And then we talk about it. And they will always say, "What? which offer do you think I should take? Jen, what do you say to those clients? <laughs> it's not my decision. This is your choice. Let's sit down and talk about each one of these items. What Maggie does with a spreadsheet and giving them control with the highlighter is brilliant. Uh, because when you get into a multiple offer situation, it gets dicey quickly and you're trying to keep track of, you know, who's on first and what's on second and to be able to have it all spelled out is enormously helpful for the sellers to try and make uh, an educated decision. And yeah, no. and the highlighter is, is great because it puts them in control of their destiny. Uh, you know, you're, you're there to give them information, but you're not there to make the decision for them. Marty, no, I don't give it to them in advance. I take that Excel document with me and I pull and I, I say, listen, I have this stack of uh, purchase offers. Congratulations. We've got nine purchase offers on your home in here. We've got a buyer. 
So, and I, so I present that. I've simplified it into an Excel document for you so we can look at the terms and conditions side by side as a comparison. And I'm gonna give you this highlighter. You're gonna tell me which things are most important to you. You're gonna highlight those. And then we're gonna break it down so you can make a decision on which offer you'd like to proceed with. Well, can I take two of them? No, we deal with one offer at a time. So you're going to deal with the best, what you feel is best for you in your personal situation. And then we're gonna talk about that. And I let them look it over and then they'll say, well, what does this mean? What does that mean? What does this mean? What does that mean? And we talk about it. So if somebody sends me a purchase offer and says they want me to give them a decision in an hour, I say, I am presenting nine offers or 20 offers or 28 offers, which I have had to present, which was a nightmare. Um, an hour will not give us time to consider, would you like to extend your time or would you like me to pull your offer? And if they say, well, you can't do that. I absolutely can. We need time, they need time to consider your offer. So if you'd like your offer to be considered, would you like to give me more time? <laughs> yeah, Jen? What's the word of the year? Reasonable. Everybody be reasonable. <laughs> if you've got 28 offers to present to a seller saying that, you know, you, you need an answer in an hour is being unreasonable. I had so. a multiple, I had a multiple offer situation a couple of years ago and um, I had done a delayed negotiation until 6 PM on Monday evening. And one of the other, the, one of the buyer's agents called me up and he said, it's 6.15 and I haven't gotten an answer from you. And I said, that's correct. You are so right. He said, it says that uh, we won't be presenting offers until six o'clock. I'm still getting offers. I will get back to you when we've made a decision. You can't do that. You need to respond to my answer right now. I said, if you'd like us to respond to your answer right now, I'm not sure that's going to put you in the best possible position. Do you want your offer presented in the best possible position? If so, you're going to need to wait. He was not happy, not reasonable. And by the way, he wrote the worst offer. <laughs> he, want, he wrote a uh, FHA offer with $500 down, which was 5,000 um, 5, under the asking price he wanted the contents of the house and wanted three different inspections. I had three cash offers that were $20,000 over on a $65,000 house. He wasn't even in the ballpark. When he lost it, he couldn't believe it. And I said, I'm sorry, your terms and conditions were not um, what the seller wanted. And that's all I have to tell him. I don't have to tell him anything else. Um, so, uh, some agents are not reasonable, so you need to be. But I like the Excel document, it works really well for me. It's very neutral. I don't use names of my clients, or of the buyers, because I realized very quickly that that could be fair, it could be perceived as a fair housing thing. If I have Jones and Kavna Kuti in one co column, one column and the other column, and they, they pick Jones, they could be perceived as a issue. Shauna? But aren't you presenting the offers? I have the offers with me if they want to look through them. Because I was thinking about that. I'm like, well, what if the name gave it away and it was a fair housing issue, but at the same time I'm presenting the, the documentation, which is still also going to have the names on it. So it's kind of a moot point. I just want to, to, to be honest, I've never had them with the Excel document. I've never had them ask for the purchase offer until it's time to sign it. Yeah. Once okay, they've, they've chosen it based on terms and the Excel document removes that level of um, intimacy mm -hmm. with the client. Well, then your but, Excel document can get pretty long and you can get lots of columns in there because it, you want to um, point out, you know, five inspections versus two inspections. Yeah. So you my, my, I you have a pretty big Excel document width wise, right? Well, I put everything this way. I put all of the, the on the left-hand column, column one, I yep. have the list price, the purchase price, the earnest deposit, uh, the 
attorney approval dates, the, um, I have everything going down the column one, which might be 30 items. And then I have column one, two, the second column is I'm number and I'm putting in the details. Okay. And I so have you're had three and four pages for, because I've had that many offers. Jen? No, I was just going to say that to Shauna's point, though, if, if you're in multiple offers with two offers, um, I, I still think it's a good idea to sort of pull out the information and put it onto an Excel. Yep, they're going to wind up seeing the actual purchase offer with the names. Um, yeah, and if, and if somebody's got a, you know, if, if you've got purchase offer A and purchase offer B that are identical, which never happens, and they're going to choose it because of somebody's last name. You know, that's I, in the real world. That's never happened in, in my universe. Um, but it's when you're in multiple offers in this type of a market, it's it's been crazy. Like, yeah, it's been a lot more than two. Um, so, yes, you know, ultimately, of course, they're going to see the actual purchase offer with the names. But, you know, at that point. Hopefully it's not an issue. And again, it's education, education, education to the seller that, you know, if it's a pink hippopotamus paying cash versus a green rhinoceros, um, does it really matter to you? Keith? Uh, so a comment and a question. Um, I really like the Excel concept. I think that's really cool to be able to kind of put the offer side by side um, it really simplifies, I think it would simplify the process for the seller for review. Um, so I really like that. And then my, so my question is, um, is it appropriate if you didn't do that? So I'm not sure why I wouldn't, but it, is it appropriate to take a contract, even if it's a single offer, let's just frame it that way. If it's a single offer to present to a, seller, is it appropriate to take the name off? Or to, I mean, not take it off, but like make a copy of it, hiding the name? And, I, I wouldn't. To avoid that or no? I wouldn't. I, I wouldn't. I mean, it's, you're, you're altering, it, it does turn into a, a legal document. So I, they need to know who the parties are. I wouldn't. Yeah, I just keep it neutral on the Excel document. The contracts are the contracts. And if they ask to see them, I just, here they are. Um, to be honest, I've never had anybody say, can I read all of the nine purchase offers? They just care about the details. Okay. Um, and the only, when they see it is when they're signing it. Yep. Yeah, don't, don't look for an issue if there isn't one. <laughs> yeah. And I, yeah, and, and for all my years of, of doing it and seeing it, I've never, that's never been a thing. Okay, cool. Thanks. Yep. Um, so listing agent must present all options uh, to the seller to allow, allow the seller to make the most informed decision, which is why I use the Excel document. All the pieces of information are there. Review what strategies the seller would like to take moving forward when faced with a multiple offer situation. Again, they don't always pick price. Sometimes they tip, uh, sometimes somebody will take the slightly less offer with the VA loan. Why? And that might be the deciding factor. Why? The VA loan is, uh, is the word guaranteed or no? <laughs> no, it's more emotional than that. Because they served or okay. most of them who served. They're, they're yeah. a, they're a family in the military. They're a military family. You know, in my family, my husband's a vet. My mother and father both served in World War II. My father-in-law was a National Guard. My brother-in-law was Vietnam era Marine Corps, three tours. My, uh, we have huge number of uh, military who served. Our first home was a VA loan. Um, so if I was given a choice to choose a, a vet, uh, who needed a house and he could afford what he or she could afford my house, I might choose that offer to help a vet because uh, we needed that hand up. And so I might choose that offer over all the others, despite everything else. But wouldn't that be a fair housing? Um, it's a seller. That's my prerogative to choose that, that 
those terms. They don't have to tell me why, but I'm just telling you from an emotional standpoint, your seller can say, this is where I got my hand up. I want to extend the same hand. I want to return that favor. They, they don't have to take the most money. They don't have to take the best terms. They can take what they want. Um, what they can't say to you is, I am not going to let a green person with purple spots who worships the God of Walmart by my house. That they cannot do because that's a fair housing violation. I'm not going to allow a person with these particular traits or characteristics, especially protected classes, by my home. And we all know that green people with purple spots are the most protected class of all. So I use that example because then I'm not violating any fair housing by leaving you. So I, that's, and that's the example I use for my sellers. So just so you know, Mr. and Mrs. Seller, if we get somebody with green spots and per, a green person with purple spots makes an offer on your house, that's not going to be a factor, right? No, I, I honor fair housing and it's important to me that you do as well. Yes, of course. If they say, no, I'm not going to let an X, Y, or Z person buy my home, my response, me personally, I will say, thank you so much for the opportunity to list your home. Unfortunately, we're not going to be able to work together. Good luck selling your home. Can you refer someone? No. Why can't I refer someone? You already know what he's, um, he's already discriminating and you know that's so what's your due diligence to share that. Well, it's my due diligence not to share that business. Right. They've got to go find other. And if someone in my office came back and said, hey, you didn't take this, how come? Well, um, did you ask them about fair housing? You may want to ask that question. So I'm going to walk away. Fortunately for me, as Jen says, in my universe, that has not happened. I have not had anybody who said that they wouldn't, uh, that there was any group of people they would not allow to buy their house. Um, but I would walk away. You have to walk away. Yeah. So, um, you know, putting it again, set expectations. I'm going to follow fair housing and make sure that at the listing agreement and then the, when you're working with buyers that everyone understands you work within your guidelines of fair housing, that they're very, very important to you. Um, listing agent must present all options, uh, review strategies with the seller they'd like to move forward, um, explain pros and cons of each strategy. Remember prices and everything. So we've just talked about that. It's always whose choice, the seller's choice. So now we're gonna review a case study. You wanna do the case study, Jen? You don't have to. Sure. Go ahead. No, that's fine. That's fine. Uh, you have a 7.30 appointment tonight for offer number one to be presented on your listing at 123 Water Street. At 5.30 PM, buyer agent two calls to tell you that she has another offer on the property. What question should you ask that agent? When will I be expecting your offer? That's one question. What's even a more important question? What is your offer? Nope. Be that's writing. not. Is it a qualified offer? It should be in writing. Correct, Cheryl. Ding, ding, ding. Yeah. Aaron, you're on the right track with saying, when shall I expect it? Because you're expecting a written offer. So you're on the right track. But don't assume anything because you know the whole word assume what that means really. Um, ask the question, is the purchase offer in writing? Has it been signed? Got to ask that question. Yeah, um, so do you want and we're being nitpicky on these words because you have to be nitpicky on these words. You have to say, is it in writing? <laughs> because you will get phone calls saying, oh, do you have another offer in? I'm, I'm writing up, I, I'm, I'm expecting an offer or I'm hopeful of an offer. That tells me it's not in writing. And it's, and they'll say, well, no, but you know, they're, they're just 
curious before they go through the effort. Well, go through the effort. It's not that much effort. So the difference in those questions, Aaron, is um, when will I be expecting an offer? They might say 1030. But they haven't even actually talked to their client yet, and it's not in writing. Where if you say, if, um, is that in writing? We're writing it now. I wanted to call you first to see if there was anything we should include in the offer before we present it. Is there anything that's really important to your seller? I make that phone call every single time. I'm, I'm, we're, I'm with my buyers right now. We're writing an offer on the property. Before we write it, is there anything your buyer, your sellers need or want that we can include? Well, they're building a house. They need a couple extra months. They are, they really, they didn't put it in the contract, but they'd really like to take this thing that's attached. Whatever it is. Great. I can write that up. So that's the difference between expecting and is it written? So um, I know we're, we're really picking that knit, but it's, it's really important. <laughs> can, can you leave like that? Can you, can you give them information that, I mean, if there's already another offer, wouldn't you just add, let them know that there's another offer and best and final? Well, click through, click through Maggie, the slide. Cause okay. I'm looking, okay. I'm looking at the final product of that slide. So Shauna, does that answer your question? Um, I, it was hard to hear you. Are, are you saying that you should then alert the? Right, if you, have, if you have one offer that you're going to present, then, then that's in writing. So if you get someone, another agent, can you hear me okay? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so then you get a second agent calling you saying she has another offer you know, wouldn't you then say, I have an offer, um, one offer already. Uh, can you submit your offer in writing best and final? Um, that way you can present them both. Well, you're, you're getting a little ahead of yourself. Oh, okay. <laughs> even, um, I, I would say. So, you know, do you tell agent two about offer one? Only if you have the seller's written permission to do so. Um, so you're not there yet uh, because until you have two purchase offers physically in hand, you only have one. Um, so once you have two, then that's a whole, that's the, the road you need to go down. And so Maggie, you can, you, you've had more experience with this <clears throat> recently than I have. So at, remember that your first appointment's at 7.30 p.m. and you're getting this call at 5.30 p.m. So if they've got two hours to get their offer together. Um, in your world of presentation, they don't need to know those details. So Shauna, if you call me up and say, I'm, um, I have another offer, is it in writing? Um, I would recommend that you get that to me as quickly as possible. Do you have another offer? I don't have my permission, the permission of my sellers to share that information with you. Or yes, my sellers in writing have uh, told me that I can tell you that I have another offer. Oh, is it a good offer? We'll see when we present the offers. My advice to you is to present highest and best always, but that's always the advice, whether it's a single offer or a multiple offer. So that's, I shouldn't even have to say that. Can I give any details of the first offer? Not really. No, I haven't even presented it to my seller. So am I going to give it to another agent? That's not kosher. Um, so no, I'm not going to tell them. And I'm never going to tell the other agent what the offer was until it's closed because if that deal fell apart, I've given them confidential information. I can't give them the details of any other contract. They can get that after it's closed from the MLS. Does that make sense? Maybe yeah, I was just going to say, put do it on the next slide, and then we'll be okay. able to talk about. All right. So option number one, the seller may elect not to entertain the second offer and to negotiate only with the first offer, first buyer. Second offer would be in a holding pattern until the seller responds to it or the buyer withdraws it. You will need permission from the seller to disclose what is going on to the buyer's agent with buyer number two. Buyer number two may not 
stick around, that's the risk. Option two, the seller may elect to entertain both offers, creating a multiple offer situation. Get the seller's permission to inform all buyer's agents of the number of offers in competition for the property and invite buyer's agents to encourage their clients to make their highest and best offer. Risk, one or both buyers could re refuse to engage in a bidding war. And it has happened. It does happen. Yeah, you a go lot from, of times the you buyers go from two to zero. <laughs> yeah. So you, uh, you are playing, uh, and it depends on the, what's going on in your local area and how people are responding. When the whole um, multiple offer and escalation clause thing came out, whew, boy, boy, howie. That they had agents who were just livid. I've never heard of such a thing. This is crap. I'm not doing this. What this isn't should be illegal. I'm going to complain to the board. It was a nightmare. Um, and those of um, those agents who were new were like they didn't know any better. So it seemed like a good idea. Guess who prevailed? You're seeing it. Multiple offers, escalation clauses, delayed negotiations. Um, option three, seller may choose to ignore the first offer and entertain only the second offer. This is rarely elected by a seller, but it is an option. And then buyer one, number one may walk away. I will tell you that a lot of sellers, if they've already dealt with number one and number one came through with a good, strong offer in good faith, not knowing that a second or third or fourth offer was following up and that the we're still in the attorney approval period. I have had sellers say, I'm sticking with number one, even though the second offer is $5,000 higher because they made that offer without duress. Everybody else came in knowing there was an offer on the table and pushed their number based on that. And I wouldn't want somebody to do that to me. So you will find that people have a conscience and then you will find people like, I want more money, kill it. Guess what? You have, that's legal and you need to be obedient and follow that. And who do you involve this time first? It's not the usual answer. Your manager? No, that. it's not the usual answer. You've already got the seller involved. So who are you calling when they say kill it? Buyer's agent. All right, buyer's agent. Ooh. The attorney had options here. So, yep, you are you're running out of options. Lawyer. There you uh, go, Marty. Yeah. You get a star on your forehead. Yes, you call the attorney. <laughs> call the attorney. There's a couple things that can happen. And you want to call your manager and get them involved. They may be able to have a conversation with a seller that might be helpful. Um, they may just kill the deal. And guess what? It's not your best interest. It's their best interest. And if that's what they want, but get people involved who are um, at a higher, get the attorney involved right then. If you can't, then call your manager. Okay. Because you, you want a second layer of protection going through that, especially now this early in your career. Okay. Does that make sense, some, everybody? Some people may not have chosen their attorney yet. So call your manager. Yeah. If you don't have the attorney, you yet, have get your manager. Getting creative. You want to do it, Jen? Sure. Sellers may ask for yet another option. Why can't I look at both offers without telling the buyers or their agents about the competition? Legally, this can be done. However, it's our experience that when buyers or sellers and their agents learn that they were not told about the competition, they feel angry and deceived. Not a good way to start a transaction. It may be more prudent to let all parties know that they're in multiples, in multiple offers so that they may put their best foot forward, uh, just what Maggie had been saying, uh, and put the sellers in the buyer's shoes. How would you feel if, um, you know, and that's, that's huge. And it goes back to the reasonableness of it all, you know, but at the end of the day, you know, some people just feel that they have to win. Um, but it is our job to be sure that they understand that 
there's been times where there's been two offers and neither buyer wanted to get involved in a multiple offer situation and both of them went away. So, you know, it's like having too many dates at the prom, you know, one finds out about the other and they both disappear. That happened to me once, by the way. It was crushing. <laughs> So again, setting expectations before you ever start receiving offers. You had a lot of uh, activity on the house. Say to the sellers, you, we had a lot of activity. We had a lot of people stayed, asked a lot of questions, called with follow up. Um, I think we're. I, I expect we're going to have multiple offers. So before we get there, I'm going to present. I tell them I'm going to give it to you in an Excel document to make it easier for you to read. Here's the risks. Um, can I get in writing that it's okay for me to let other people know that we're in a multiple offer situation if that happens? And I'd like you to sign that. Oh, why do you need to sign that? Because I can't tell people they're in a multiple offer and it can frustrate other agents and it can make them feel angry because they feel deceived and lied to, even though it's perfectly legitimate and legal. But what I like to do is I like to be uh, very transparent with people. I like for people to know what's going on every step of the transaction. I feel like if we start the transaction on a good foot, we go, the whole transaction works better. And they usually say, oh yeah, that makes sense. So is it okay? I said, I don't give them the details. I just let them know that we're in a multiple offer situation. And then we're receiving, you know, a number of offers. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's fine. You can't tell them how much. No, we don't reveal that ever. Yeah, we'll get to the escalation class thing. Um, so, uh, you know, if you set, again, if you set the expectation before you get there, it's so much easier to deal with than the stress of all of a sudden they've got these offers and they've got to make a decision and there's all these things. Get it handled before. Preempt. <laughs> be, be proactive. Get ahead of things. Behind things is not a good position. Jen? Anything? Well, I was just going to say to the next slide, we can talk more okay. about the caveats. Okay, multiple offer caveats. Seller has extended any form of counter offer to the buyer. That counter offer must be withdrawn by the seller before negotiating with any other buyer to avoid creating a multiple counter scenario. Don't do it. Stay out of it. Think of this as quicksand. This is unsure ground. It can get you in trouble, it can get your sellers in trouble, it can get the buyers in trouble. It's just, it is not worth it. Sellers and buyers may want you to enter here. Say, danger, danger, Will Robinson, throw your arms around. No, this is bad juju. We don't want to go here. And my job is to help protect you to make sure we have a good, valid, solid offer without conflict. So let's just deal with one offer at a time. Having we... said all that, agents do do it. Yep. Don't you be one of them. Don't play. Don't, Don't be play. one of them, please. I was so appalled about eight months ago when I had a conversation with a local agent, one of our agents, who does a ton of business. And, you know, this is his... MO. This is his modus operandi. And I'm like, it's, it's not good business practice. And, and I, and I'm like, you know, one of these days it will come back to bite him. And, you know, until then, sadly, uh, he is still doing it. And it is a horrible, horrible business practice. Check in with your manager and, and ask the question. So the counter offer can be withdrawn by a seller at any time before notice of acceptance by the buyer and via any mode of withdrawal if the offer does not stipulate specific mode of withdrawal. That's a complicated sentence. It is. It is. And it's basically, you know, the bottom line is um, negotiating these back and forth, it could wind up with dust. You could wind up with nothing. Um, so don't don't let your sellers play fast and loose uh, because they could wind up with nothing, even in this market. So I, you know, I think that that's sort of that is a very convoluted sentence. 
So a seller can withdraw before we have it in New York state, let's consider an attorney approval, but they need to talk to their attorney about that. And they're going to have to confirm with their attorney that they're, that's what they're doing in New York state. We do have to have, um, if we've accepted, we need to um, have a cancellation in writing that so they're, they're not proceeding. And that needs to be signed by both parties. And then it has to get back to the attorneys. It's best not to put yourself in a position to have to fill out a cancellation. Your objective is to get to closing. I use transaction desk and I like to use a template. I do not put the cancellation form form in my template. Why? I think it's bad juju. So I don't put it in there because I'm not talking about cancellations. I'm talking about closing. I'll go get that cancellation form if I need it. I've needed it one time. Don't, don't uh, put yourself in a position of getting to closing, bringing everybody to closing. It's your job. You're the border collie in this scenario. They're the sheep. You are bringing them back to the pasture. Just keep don't, bringing them around. Just keep bringing don't them play around. Fast and, don't play fast and loose with other people's money because that's sort of what this boils down. It's not a game. Um, it's This is you know serious stuff with lots of money on the line. So um, yeah, I mean, the with best practices going forward, document, document, document. Yep, and then and it, has any have any of you ever seen a border collie work a herd of sheep and bring them back toward a, a pen? They nudge. They just shoulder, shoulder, shoulder. They don't bite. They don't nip. They don't bark. They're quiet. They're stealthy little things. I used to raise border collies. Um, we didn't have sheep, but we had ducks. My poor ducks were very well exercised. Anyway, because she kept bringing them back to the barn, and they wanted to be in the creek. They just they just gently push with their shoulder over here, over here over here, think of yourself in that way. You're just nudging. You're just gently bringing people around. Um, you can't force, don't force, don't bark, don't bite. Just gently bring people around and remind them of the objective. The objective is to sell the house. And the objective is, and stick with the buyer that you've accepted. If Try to prevail on that thought and move along. Because sometimes that green grass turns out to be filled with weeds. Best business practice, practices, advise sellers to counter one offer at a time. That's it, period. Simultaneous counter offers, if not <laughs> meticulously crafted and monitored. I don't even want to read this sentence. Don't do it. This big red line through this. This is the word you should take out of this sentence. Simultaneous counter offers lawsuits the potential is gigantic here do not do this and similarly the next line advise buyers do not submit offers on more than one property at a time because they may wind up buying two houses unless that's their objective then that's fine well right but that's rare it's um, like one in a, uh, a ten thousand maybe or less yeah, so in this crazy market that we're in, please be that voice of reason um, and, and explain to people the financial and legal ramifications uh, because this does happen. Um, it's rare, it's, it's very rare, but I have heard of it happening and it's a, it's a legal and financial mess. So just don't go there and explain to your clients you know, why you're being so diligent and, you know, why it's, you know, it's one, let's do this one at a time. We're not playing fast and loose here. The, the people in this category, the buyers who may want to submit more offers are most often investors who are adding to their inventory of homes, but even they usually are only dealing with one at a time. But most often, if you have the scenario, it's an investor. Otherwise, it's just, it's just bad business. They can wind up with two houses that they can't afford and you're going to break them. Maggie, that happened to me with when we were selling our cottage to a friend. She also put an offer on another house down the road and she ended up with both houses 
and then had to turn around and sell the cottage she had purchased for me. Right. And, it, and there's closing costs on both houses. And I if you, what, sorry. you yeah. lose your shirt. Yeah. She said to me, can I come out? And I said, no, that's you, you know, that was an agreement. She ended up buying both. Yeah. It's, um, it, 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 don't go here. Just don't go here. <laughs> Simultaneous counter offers lawsuits. That's what just link those things together. And just stay out of there. You don't, I don't want anything to do with my E&O insurance. I don't want anything to do with uh, fair housing. I don't want anything to do with lawsuits. I want to stay as clean and neat and tidy and as quiet and under the wire as I can possibly get by just doing my job to the best of my ability. What about when, go ahead, Jen. You've presented a written offer to a seller and seller accepts the offer in writing. You leave a voicemail message for the buyer's agent that the offer has been accepted and then the seller gets another offer. How would you advise the seller? Has he sold his home or not? Anybody have any opinions on this? And, would, and we're unique in New York state. I'll give you that little hint. Cheryl, go ahead. I don't know. I'm just going to take a guess on this because I'm not the expert, obviously, at least not yet. Um, I would say yes. I'm going to say he, he has to go, unless it's in writing and delivered, is that correct with the offer, even though it was a verbal over the phone? So the seller accepts an offer in writing. You leave a voicemail message for a buyer's agent that the offer has been accepted and then the seller gets another offer. How would you advise the seller? Do they ha have they sold their home or not? Cheryl Walton, you had unmuted too. I was going to say yes, because they had already put it in writing. Um, I think that's the clincher, but I could be wrong. <laughs> How would you advise them? That, that they had already taken that positive step forward in writing and that um, they need to proceed with that before, you know, looking at anything else. I don't know. <laughs> You're half right. Okay. So they should deal with the offer that they accepted. Shauna? So my guess would be is if there's not a counter offer, which they could retract, um, and it was a, a straight up written off acceptance, then they would have to speak to their attorney. And then that'd be between the seller and their attorney. You have a three day approval, right? So you could you you could go that way. I I would go a different way. Maggie, you tell us what you would do. So this is what I would do. I would say I would say to my seller, congratulations, you've got a written and accepted offer, and it would be my um in my judgment, it, the best thing to do would proceed to the offer that we've written on. However, you have a second offer in hand and I do have to present that to you. So I'm gonna show you that offer. However, I still think we should proceed with the first offer and work with that buyer. In the event um, that anything comes up, we can ask them if they wanna be in a backup position, if that's something you wanna do. I'm going to proceed with offer number one as far as possible. I'm, I'm not going to bring up the attorney approval period and you can kill the offer because I, I, I want to work with the offer I've got in hand. But um, I have to present the second offer. I have to present the second offer. Cheryl Walton, that's why I said you were half right. They've got to see it because I have to present it. So what if it's cash and the other one was conventional and it's $10,000 more? They might say, Maggie, I don't care what you think. I wanna take the second offer. Okay, great, now we involve your attorney. And then we start communicating with everybody. Let's talk to your, your attorney first. Jen? Don't have an attorney. Let me give you the name and number of a good one. <laughs> so I have to present both offers because I have to present all offers. I want to stay with offer number one because I think that's good business. I think that's the right way to do it. At the ultimately, the seller decides. So the word is 
how do you advise the seller? I don't tell them what to do. I don't make their decision for them. I give them advice. Does that make sense? Shauna, you don't look like that makes sense to you. Does, okay. I'm speaking without my <laughs> mute up. No, it does make sense to me. I mean, I actually had a similar situation, um, you know, where the seller was like, well, well, what would you do? Which, which one do I choose? I said that you, you have to make this decision. This is your decision. Yeah, you just advise them. And I, I, I always like to tell them the first offer is usually the best offer. We've already told them yes. How would you feel if it was you? I do like to walk a mile in other people's shoes. But ultimately, it's up to you. It's your decision. Okay, what about this one? The buyer's agent contacts you and makes a verbal offer on your listing on behalf of his buyer client. Should you rely on, should you relay this offer to your seller? And how should you, the listing agent, counsel the seller? Tim, you're muted. Are you talking to us? No, I'm reading out loud. But oh. just me, just to get the scenario in my head. Sorry. So, Paul, what would you do? <laughs> Verbal offer. Am I relaying it? Verbal offer? I personally wouldn't even, I don't know. I mean, it, I feel like that could only make things go downhill. And then if they reject the other one, yeah, I feel like you're just getting into territory you don't even want to get into. Verbal offer, I feel like I'd, it, it's almost equivalent to nothing, right? It is nothing. It's yeah. not it is almost. nothing. It in is. New York State, especially in new york state i don't know how any other state is i do know in new york state a verbal mm -hmm. offer is worth less mm -hmm. it is a big fat goose egg like i said oh, you yes. could take a tissue and write a purchase offer on a tissue and that would actually be in writing and would have to be presented a verbal offer is nothing dated with signatures that tissue well yeah Still has to be dated and have to and have signatures. Yeah. I mean, it's got to have all the pertinent stuff, but yep, yeah, which um, you're not going to be able to do, but not in New York State, God forbid. Um, but you could, maybe a whole roll of toilet paper. Right. <laughs> um, so a verbal offer, you're not going to present. So what you say to, uh, let's say Deb Kennedy called me and said, Maggie, I've got a verb, uh, um, I've got an offer. My clients want to offer 200,000 on your $180,000 listing on Water Street. Um, and they don't want any inspections or anything. Can you present it to your sellers? And I said, absolutely. As soon as I receive it in writing, I will be happy to deliver it to them. Well, can you just call them up and see how they feel about it? When I have it in writing, I will absolutely deliver it to them. Get it to me in writing as soon as possible. No, but I, I, I'm on my way out to dinner with my husband and it's a birthday party for a family member. That's great. I hope you have a wonderful evening. When you get it in writing, let me know and I'll present the offer to my sellers. Be very prepared to have that exact conversation because you'll have it over and over and over again because there are many, many very incredibly lazy realtors out there. And, and you notice you're not, you're not being, I'm not being negative saying, no, I'm not going to present your offer until you put it in writing. That's great. As soon as I have it in writing, I will. So put a positive spin on it. Yeah, absolutely. As soon as I have it in writing, I'll present it. But can't you just take it to them now? As soon as I have it in writing, I'll present it. Well, why won't you, why won't you submit my verbal offer in Frankly, Deb, in New York State, it's not an offer until it's in writing. So once you have it in writing, I'm happy to present it. I want to present it. So bring it to me in writing, and I'll be glad to get it in front of them. I'll, I will make every effort to get it in front of them as quickly as possible. If you have to educate them, educate them kindly, gently, because you may want you may be working with them for the next 60 days to 90 days. Gently, kindly, graciously positively stay up above. I love Michelle Obama. When they go low, you go high, right? So go high, just keep going, We're going high. Rise above it. Rise above it and be what? Jen's word of the year, reasonable. Be reasonable. reasonable. Goodness gracious. Highest and best, I love the wishbone. I found this graphic, I loved it. Um, as a buyer's agent, remember to prepare the buyer for a multiple offer scenario before the offer is written. 
explore ways to um, strengthen your chances of the offer being accepted. We've talked about some of those ways to strengthen. What are they? What are ways to strengthen your buyer's offer? Waive the inspection. Is that, that not a good More answer? money down. Mm -hmm. More money down is a good one. I like that better, yeah. Marnie. Well, well, I'm, Paul, I'm saying I, I've, I've heard. you can take the inspection off, but it's not in your buyer's best interest if you can keep the deal together without that, without taking no, that I, off the table. I, yeah, I agree. I just heard of, I mean, I know in this market I've heard. Oh, I know. But it's, it's, it's really not, we're not going to promote that to you. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was going to say, don't, don't we give them that idea? If mm -hmm. they come back to you saying, hey, what about, you know, there's a whole lot of, caveats in doing that you know so, it's like okay mr and mrs buyer are you prepared if the furnace is no good and you won't know that until you've closed and you know you go down there you know it's just it's or you know the roof is at the end of life um you know are you prepared to take on those expenses you know is that so just if it's a two year old house just been built, it's in relatively good condition and they have the resources to fix or repair minor things that may come up, that might be a good option. If they're investors with a cash offer, they're gonna gut the place, fine. I don't have a problem with that. If right. they are first time home buyers buying a, 18, a 1910 house in the city that hasn't been updated since 1982, I'm concerned for them to not have an inspection. I at minimum want them to have an HSA warranty, but I'm going to be very frank with them. If you have a problem with the roof, if you have a problem with the electrical, if you have a problem with the heating system, if you have a problem with the air conditioner, if you have a problem with this or that mold, are you, do you have resources to remediate those problems? If not, this may not be the right house for you. And after you've had that conversation, then you're gonna write an email so you have that in writing, um, just as your own paper trail. Yeah, so be very careful of the inspection thing. So the first thing I want you to do is pick up the phone and call who on a, um, to strengthen your offer, who are you gonna call? It's a buyer's agent, who are you calling before you write your offer? No. The seller's agent? <laughs> yes, the listing agent. And I'm going to ask what? Before I'm writing my purchase offer, when am I going to ask the listing agent? Are there any specifics that would interest the seller? There you go. That's it. So I'm going to, I'm going to start with the listing agent. Hey, great news. My clients are really interested in your home. They're, they want to write an offer before we write it. Is there anything your sellers need that I may be able to include in the offer? It's a simple conversation. It shows sincerity. I'm already building the relationship with the listing agent. I want them to know I'm going to be working with them, not against them, the entire process. And no, sadly, nobody does this. <laughs> and it's, it's such a fabulous bridge builder. And, you know, the listing agent can say, nope, just get me an offer in writing and we'll go from there. But you know what? You've you've opened the door to a dialogue, and you know what's the worst that the listing agent can say? Nope, just get me something in writing. Okay. Shana? Is it leading at all to do that? Nope. No. I mean, I'm, if I came back and, and said like a, a forty-five close day as a listing agent, I mean, closing as soon as possible. No, there's nothing wrong with that. So the, no, because. The, yeah. Go ahead. If that's really important to their sellers, the listing agent is going to tell somebody that, um, you know, if, if there's any way possible, you know, my people would love to either get out quick or would like to stay until the end of school. If you guys could make that part of your offer, that would be great. Um, that's not giving anything away. It's, it's, you know, that's pertinent information that's not um, you know, information that doesn't, shouldn't be disclosed. That's a, and, you know, a listing agent's going to know that, you know, it's not like, well, they're getting divorced and they need to sell it. That's not cool. That's not information you should share. 
Um, and, you know, like I said, some listing agents will be like, nope, you know, nothing, but you never know. Yeah, so it could be something that's attached to the house that they really want to take with them. Um, it could be a uh, quicker closing. It could be a longer closing. They could be saying, we got school aid kids, kids, if we could have a 60 day closing with an extra 10 days so that they could finish the semester before we have to move out, that'd be great. Okay, what date, are you, what date does that um, semester end? Oh, it ends on, you know, May 28th. Great, thank you. Now you've got a solid date and you can work with it. You can look at your calendar and you can say, okay, we're gonna close on June 1st. Give them all the time they need. Maggie? Yes. Well, I, I would assume this would fall into the same category as previous discussions that as long as you're given that same message to all buying buyer agents that are asking that question. Oh yeah. yeah. If, if you tell one person, you tell everybody who asks right. you. So asking was asking. a good caveat. I'm not right. calling you up if you didn't ask me. Right. And guess Thank what? You. They're not all asking me. Yep. I'm going to be lucky if one person calls me and asks, but I will tell you that the people right now who are winning multiple offer scenarios over and over again, they are almost all calling the listing agent and asking. And you know, you're not giving anything away. You can't, as Jen said, confidentiality, you must maintain. But if there's something that they need and want, yeah. They don't want to deal with any inspections. And, and don't assume, you know, if you're going to make the phone call to the listing agent, listing agent's like, nope. And I'm, so I'm going to say, okay, so there's no pertinent dates that they would rather have. There's, you know, nothing else, you know, other than what's in the listing that you know, we should know about and you know has to be direct and the worst that they can say is nope 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 put it in writing okay great because there are sellers that they've already decided they're everything that's going with the house is staying with the house they're not in a big hurry they're they, they don't you know they're they're all set where they're going they don't need anything special so some people don't need anything some listing agents just don't for some reason don't play well with others um most do and most are happy to answer those questions that's my experience um so you be the agent that's asking the question so you can write the best possible offer you still might not be the best possible offer somebody could knock it out of the park without having asked those questions just because they've got the experience to know how to write it and they have the clients who have the resources to write a better offer so many times in a buy seller's market, you, some of your buyers are going to lose to people who with better financial positioning, period. Nothing you can do about that. Um, always encourage your buyers to make the highest and best offer and remind buyer and seller decides which to negotiate. It's the seller's prerogative, not the licensees. And then look at this, Jen, it's 1228. Um, handouts and worksheets. Um, here is a multiple offer comparison sheet. You can add to this. So you already hit, this is an Excel document um, that somebody else, this is very, this might be based on mine. Um, yeah, so inspections, I actually have, mine is expanded. I have home inspection, radon, pest, chimney, other. Sept, it might be septic and well, um, and I write those in where necessary. I may alter my document on my Excel for my particular house. I do. So I don't put in things that aren't necessary. I just put in what's necessary. So I have an Excel document that I've created that I can manipulate for each sale. So I don't have empty lines because it's confusing to the client. You've got this. This is in your ebook. Yes. So if you're at all good with Excel, I would recommend that you create a document <laughs> like this. I put mine in landscape. Um, so I could get more offers across the top. You need to go to bed, little girl. I know. I'm I'm going to sign off. All right. Goodbye, honey. I'll see you on Monday. Bye, bye everybody. We will see everybody on Monday. Bye. Yeah. I'm going to stop bye. share. Does anybody have any questions? No, but I just want to comment that everything you're sharing with us is so helpful. I I can't thank you enough for all the tidbits that you're giving us. Good. Well, we're, that's what we're here for. Yeah. <laughs> it is. And 
Ayan, between other, Maggie and I had, had a lot of experience. At, I had other offers at other agencies, but what you guys are offering is way beyond. So it's nice to know that I chose wisely. <laughs> oh, good. I'm glad you feel that way. You know what, Cheryl, spread that word. If anybody stays in touch with anybody who they went to real estate school with, uh, and I, I know it was all online, but if you I know other people who chose yeah. not as wisely, um, you know, stay in touch with them and ask them, um, you know, you, you get a little bump from the company if you facilitate bringing somebody in, so... Well, I have a girlfriend who's working on a real estate. She's like, I'm following you wherever you go. I'm following you. I'm like, okay, we will, you know, whatever. Perfect. So, I'm really, I'm really pleased. So I just wanted to put a shout out to you guys. Well, thank you. Thank you. Anybody, in the mail, Cheryl. <laughs> anybody else have any questions? I'll hang around if you do. Jen, go to bed. Bye, sweetie. I'm going to bed. Bye, Feel Jen. No. Yeah. So anybody got any questions? I know it's yeah, a lot. A lot of do I have to pay for a dot loop subscription or is there a way to do it free? <laughs> oh, I, um, which board are you in? Which what now? Which board are you aligned with? Um, the, I have the uh, Elmira Corning. Uh, so you'll have to ask your manager because I don't know that board. We have Transaction Desk if you're on in Rochester or Buffalo. We have GRAR and Transaction Desk is free through the board. Um, we have through Howard Hanna, there's a zip forms, which does work with dot loop. Um, most of the boards have something, but I'm not sure of every single board in the state, to be honest, Kevin. So ask your manager, they'll know. Um, I, I love transaction desk. It's, uh, and I love that it's free. It's awesome. Um, and I use it all the time. I, I love to have my electronic documents, but I do writing for people who that's just the way they, they operate in life. I use the written ones. Anybody have any questions? Mm -hmm. Purchase offers accepted, okay. I mean, you guys are welcome to sign off, but if you have questions, I'll answer them. Um, just don't mm. think you have to learn everything today, this minute. Peggy, can you add yes, we do. a transaction <laughs> desk on your phone? It's a terrible. Uh, you can. Terrible. I don't. No. I, I. I never use it. I can't. I. My eyes are too poor. I can't read it. I can't. I get so frustrated. Um. I will take my laptop and use my phone as a hotspot and do it that way. Mm. Um. I would. I do not do it on my phone. I think there's too high a risk of my pushing the wrong buttons. The only thing I will do on my phone is accept a document. Click. 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 Um, because that's easy. I can do that easily on my phone. Uh, but I will never write one on my phone. Not ever. No, it's too it's important a transaction document. Transaction what? Transa uh, in my board, it's transaction desk, authenticine. Okay. It's the major thing is authenticine and the company that produces that is called Lone Wolf. Um, I don't know if your board has it. If you're in the Rochester, Buffalo area, you do. Syracuse too. I don't know about Capital Region. I think you guys have zip forms. And zip forms, yep. Zip forms, yep. 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 So there's usually something. Shauna, do you have a question? No. Nope. Somebody had one, I thought. No. Anybody? Okay. Well then. All right. All right. Very helpful. Good day. Thank you. You're yeah. welcome. Thank you. Let me know if you need anything. Take care, guys. Will do. Bye. Bye.